Hi everyone. Welcome to 3G NY Stories Live We Do Wednesday. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Alexis Fishman. I'm a 3G NY board member originally from Australia and I'm the grandchild of four Holocaust survivors. This is our 25th We Do Wednesday, our virtual series that brings our educational initiative We Do from classrooms to your living rooms. 3GNY is an educational nonprofit for grandchildren of survivors and supporters. As a living link, we preserve the legacies and lessons of the Holocaust. Our mission is to educate diverse communities about the perils of intolerance and to provide a supportive forum for the descendants of survivors. For tonight's event, we will be featuring 3GNY's inaugural executive director, Dave Reckes, who's going to share the story of his grandmother, Booby Sarah. Uh, and let me just say, as a longtime board member, it was a pipe dream to ever have an executive director. And we are so thrilled that Dave uh, is working with us. It's really a treat. Um, and we're really very, very happy. So tonight's program showcases 3GNY's flagship educational initiative, We Do, which is short for We Educate. We Do is a four week training program that empowers grandchildren of survivors to learn and compellingly share their families' Holocaust experiences in school classrooms and with community groups. Education is more important and more urgent than ever, given the horrifying rise of anti Semitism that we see in the headlines. We know we need to keep doing this work as much as we possibly can. Studies have shown that students who receive Holocaust education are more tolerant and comfortable with people of different races and backgrounds. They're more willing to challenge incorrect or biased information and are more likely to be upstanders. Through our grandparents' testimony, we talk about the importance of stepping in early and often, wherever small injustices are found, on the playground, in the classroom, and on the street, because that is the easiest and most effective way to act. By the time Nazi tanks roll in, it's too late. 3GNY has trained more than 375 speakers in New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia, and across the country. We've spoken in more than 500 classrooms and have impacted more than 40,000 students and community members. And between our live programming and our YouTube channel, more than 18,000 additional people have heard our stories. Hope is not lost, and we need to keep doing the work, now more than ever. You can help us accomplish this through a financial gift. This will go directly to training more speakers, therefore reaching even more students. We do not solicit donations from schools, teachers or students. We provide our programming to schools completely free of charge and we aim to keep the cost of training uh, to three Gs as low as we possibly can. Um, there is a link with ways to donate in the chat and we hope that you will consider making a gift. If you've already donated to us and you're a long time We Do Wednesday fan, we thank you so much, we really appreciate it. Um, you can sponsor an event or program in honour or in memory of a survivor or loved one. And uh, there are also corporate sponsorship opportunities available too. So that's all from me. Thank you again so much from be for being here tonight. You're really helping us to honour the memories of our grandparents and ensuring that never again is more than just an em empty phrase. I would now like to call on Aaron Gins, 3GNY's brand new education and outreach coordinator, who will introduce himself and then introduce Dave. Well, thank you, Alexis. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Aaron Gins, uh, 3GNY's new education and outreach coordinator and grandson of a Holocaust survivor. I've been a We Do speaker for just about over a year now, and uh, I'm very excited to uh, start in an official capacity uh, working uh, for 3G and hoping to uh, improve already such a great uh, program that we have going on. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce you to Dave Reckes. He's the grandson of four Holocaust survivors and has been 3GNY's executive director since March 2021. After Bubby Sarah passed away in 2020, Dave knew it was up to him, along with his siblings and cousins, to keep her stories alive for future generations. He was grateful to discover 3GNY and the We Do training, which helped him honor her memory by continuing to tell her stories. Dave quickly felt at home with the 3G community and was thrilled to find a new professional home as 3GNY's first executive director. Dave is honored to lead 3GNY, support 3Gs in telling their stories through We Do, and help others find meaning and connection as the grandchildren of Holocaust survivors. It's just my first week uh, on the team, but Dave has just been uh, incredible uh, so far to work with, and uh, it's my honor to uh, introduce you to Dave Reckes. Dave, take it away. 
Hi, everybody. Uh, and Aaron, thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I'm just as excited to have you on our team and really excited to see how together we can continue to grow the impact that our volunteers have, our speakers have on students, community members, um, and how we can continue the legacy and lessons of the Holocaust. So thank you for your part, Aaron. Um, and thank you also, Alexis, and the rest of the 3GNY board um, for your support tonight and really for the last year and, and more. Um, for all the encouragement that you've given to me and to so many others to, to do this important work together. Um, it's really touching to look at the attendance list. I know you can't see it, you all at home, um, but I'm looking through and seeing so many names of family members, friends, um, 3Gs who've gone through our training, volunteers, people that I've gotten to partner with and work with and learn from, um, so many people that I really respect. So uh, thank you so much for being here tonight and uh, being here to, to share a little bit um, along with me about my grandmother and about the, you know, the reason that we do this work of sharing those stories, those personal stories from the Holocaust to help us all continue the lessons into future generations. Um, I wanna start a little bit differently than I, I normally do in a class um, because I wanna, I wanna share a picture with you um, of, this is my grandmother and my son. Um, many of you who are here know or knew my grandmother, knew Bobby Sarah, um, and many of you know Owen also. Um, and for those of you who don't, you're gonna to get to know Bobby Sarah tonight and a little bit about Owen as well. Um, this picture, says a lot about how it is that I came to 3GNY in the first place, um, or that I found 3GNY. This picture is from the very last time that I saw my grandmother before she passed away. It's from October of 2019, just before her 97th birthday. Um, she came up to visit just for a day, and she came up right after delivering or visiting a fifth and sixth grade class uh, downstate near where my parents live to share her story with them. And I was so touched and thrilled to hear her response to how the, how the students reacted to her being there. She wasn't sure they were younger than she was used to speaking to, it was a different demographic. And she was overjoyed at the empathy that they showed, the connection, the questions they asked, and their, their genuine interest in her story, her legacy, and what it's been like in the years since the Holocaust for her to carry that story with her. So a few months after this picture was taken, my grandmother passed away um, unexpectedly at age 97, if you can imagine that. Um, Mom, I'm sorry, you probably need the tissues already, but we'll get through this. Um, after, soon after she passed away, Owen, I'm so grateful that he had a chance to really get to know her and build a relationship with her, as did my daughter, Anya. Um, and Owen's class that next school year started reading The Devil's Arithmetic, a, a novel that's set in, uh, in the Holocaust and tells the story of the Holocaust. And all of a sudden it struck me that, whereas if it had been the previous year, I would have just called my grandmother and said, you need to go talk to Owen and his classmates and share your story to help them learn from you. But she wasn't there anymore. And I realized at that moment that now that responsibility, that role is on me. Um, and as Aaron said, on, on my sister, my sister, my brother, my cousins, it's on us to carry that story forward and to figure out how to make it relevant, to make it meaningful, and to make sure that it is not lost for Owen, and for Anya, for all of their peers and classmates, and for all of the next generation. Enter 3GNY. I found out about the We Do class and the training. I signed up, and I instantly knew I was in the right place. I felt the connection with other 3Gs around that shared history, that shared family experience. And I knew that this is what I had to do to be able to share Bobby Sarah with students, with community members, with, with all of you tonight. Um, so thank you for being here. And what I'm going to do now is share um, pretty much what I share when I go into classrooms um, with a few little asides that will be a little bit particular to, to our audience tonight. Um, but I'll start with the way that I introduce my grandmother to students. 
So this is the picture that I use to introduce her. And I tell them that this is my grandmother, Sarah, um, that she passed away two years ago at age 97. And you can see that she's little. That's me on the left, my brother Jacob on the right. Um, and I joke that she was tiny, but she was mighty. She had an awesome personality, bigger than life, really vibrant. She was spunky. She was fun. She spoke her mind, whether you wanted to hear it or not. Um, and she was just a lot of fun to be around. And I ask students if they have, and if any of them have special names that they use to refer to their grandparents or their grandmother. And I often, depending on where I'm speaking, I'll get a lot of Nana or Grams or Grammy, um, Abuela, things like that. And I love that because then I get to tell them that I had a special name that I used for my grandmother too. And I use this as a way to introduce the fact that she grew up in Poland. And I show this map to make sure that students know where Poland is. And this is a map from before World War II. Lately, we've talked a lot also about where Ukraine is just to the east of Poland because students know about Ukraine and that a lot of refugees are fleeing into Poland from there. And I tell them that my grandmother, like most people in Poland, grew up with her main language being Polish. But she also, as someone who is Jewish, grew up speaking a language that lots of Jews throughout Europe spoke, and many still do today, and that that language is called Yiddish. And sometimes we talk about Yiddish and Yiddishisms that are in our lexicon today, um, and about Yiddish culture and the things that were happening before the war. And so I tell them that the name that I always had for my grandmother was the Yiddish word for grandmother, which is booby. And so to me, she was my booby Sarah. But here's the thing. She wasn't just my booby Sarah. Uh, you saw in the promotion for tonight's event that I called her everybody's booby. It wasn't just me. Lots of people called her everybody's booby because she was the kind of person who loved being around other people. She loved talking, playing cards. She could dance up a storm at any party. Um, she was the kind of person who made everyone feel like they had a special relationship with her. She was everybody's booby. My friends would often ask me, when's booby coming to visit? As if she was their booby too. And I love telling students that I know that if booby had a chance to visit them in their classroom, that she would hope they consider her to be their booby as well. So one thing about Booby Sarah is that she hated the cold from the day she was born to the day she died. She could not stand the cold. And when she was a kid in the 1920s, um, which uh, she lived in a city in Poland called Lublin. And here are a few pictures of Lublin from the 1920s and 30s. I now live outside of Syracuse, New York, and Lublin is very similar in size to Syracuse, and it's just as cold in the wintertime. And so Bobby Sarah and her friends um, in Lublin, there was a, a like downtown, there was an outdoor skating rink in the winter. And her friends would often invite her to come down and go ice skating together. Now, Bobby Sarah was very social. She would never turn down a chance to be with friends. So she would ask her mom for a little bit of money so that she could rent the skates and she'd go and meet her friends. But she never went skating. She would show up and she would talk to her friends and convince them that instead of going ice skating, they should take their money, go into the cafe nearby, buy some hot chocolates and sit inside and chat and talk and be warm. And that's usually what happened because that's the kind of person that Bobby Sarah was. People wanted to follow it and be social with her. So as Bobby grew up, um, she started noticing some things changing in her hometown in Lublin. By the early 1930s, she was only allowed to play with other Jewish friends. Even at school, the Jewish kids, she went to a school that had Jewish and non-Jewish students. But at recess time, the Jewish students had to, one little section of the playground that they could play in, whereas everyone else, the non-Jewish students could play wherever they wanted to. And on her way home from school, because she had to walk to and from school every day, she started to notice signs popping up on storefronts, on homes, on apartment buildings. And they said things like, no dogs or Jews allowed. 
her parents' business started suffering too because non-Jewish customers were visiting Jewish-owned stores less and less, including Bubi's parents' fabric store. Anti-Semitism, which is the hatred of Jews, and I take some time with students to help them understand what that means, the hatred of Jews just for being Jewish. And that feeling was increasing in lots of places all over Europe. Now, Bubi Sarah, as a teenager, had read in school about Adolf Hitler and about the Nazi party, and that they had come to power in Germany, and that they were passing anti-Semitic laws that were making it harder and harder for Jews in Germany. And she knew it wasn't just in Germany. As I just said, friends were treating her differently. She wasn't allowed to play. Businesses were suffering. People on the street would be rude to her and her Jewish friends just because they were Jewish. But still, to Bubi, Hitler and Germany and the whole Nazi thing was a whole other country away. Right? I tell kids, it's like when we hear about news in Canada. It seems like it's a whole other world. It doesn't matter. It's never going to affect us. She was sure that Hitler would be stopped before anything really bad came to Poland. And what Bubi always said to me and to many others, you have to go on living. So she still hung out with her friends when she could, the Jewish ones only. She went to school. Her family even got to go on vacations every now and then. And then in September of 1939, Germany invaded Poland. World War II had begun. Bubi Sarah was 16. German soldiers took over the city of Lublin very quickly. They started instituting laws and rules that made life a little bit different for Bubi and her friends. Jews were required to wear yellow armbands and at all times identifying them as Jews. The Nazis ordered Jewish businesses, including Bubi Sarah's parents, to stay open, but only so that the Nazi officers could walk in, take whatever they wanted, and leave without paying. Bubi stopped going to school because Jews weren't allowed anymore. Nazis demanded money from Jewish families. They rounded up Jewish boys and men and shipped them off to labor camps to help the Nazi war effort. And if anyone resisted, they were beaten or even killed. Bubi Sarah's older brother didn't want to get sent to a labor camp. So he tried to flee east to Russia but he was caught, he was arrested, and he was sent to prison. The Nazis forced the Jews to abandon their homes and to move into a small section of Lublin that came to be called the Jewish ghetto. Bubi Sarah ended up crammed into one, a small apartment with her parents, her younger brother, and nine other people, and there was one bedroom. This is a picture from a trip that she took in 1991. That building is the building where she lived with those 13 or 11 other people for a year. This was their home. In a very short amount of time, Bubi Sarah's entire world had been flipped upside down. Life in the ghetto was miserable. There were strict curfews put in place. Food was scarce. It was crowded. Lice, typhus, and other diseases spread rapidly. As I said, the Jews were required to wear a yellow armband identifying them as Jews. And if you were found on the street without your armband, you could be shot. If you were out past the 8 p.m. curfew, you could be shot. One night, the Nazis marched down the streets yelling, Raus, Raus, which means out, out. And they gave everyone one minute to come out of their apartments into the town square. And they used the butts of their guns to push and herd some people onto trucks like the ones in this picture here. To be sent away and no one knew where to. Bobby saw one woman refuse to get on the truck and Bobby Sarah watched as a Nazi officer pulled the woman aside and shot her. 
nighttime raids like this became a regular occurrence. I'm gonna let Bobby Sarah share with you a little bit of what it felt like to live in the ghetto. And so as I get ready to share this video clip, you may need to turn your volume up a little bit to hear her well. Um, so take a moment to do that if you would like. Here she is, so listen carefully. And the slow deterioration of humanity, you feel treated like a like dirt, worse than a dog, worse than a stray dog. And the slow dehumiliation, the slow, the taking away of the dignity was worse than hunger and cold and everything. You really lost your desire to do anything. But you still go on. I want to emphasize something that Bobby Sarah just said. She talked about her word, dehumiliation, the dehumanization. And when I share this video clip with students, we stop and we talk about that a little bit, about how it was intentional, it was purposeful, that the Nazis wanted to treat Jews as less than human. They wanted Jews to feel themselves as not even human, and even more so, to make it easier for the Polish people to treat Jews as inhuman. It makes it easier to turn a blind eye or to do even worse when you don't think of the other person as a human being. Yet somehow in the midst of all of this, as Bobby said at the end of that clip, you have to go on. And I, that's what she always said, you have to go on living. And knowing the dangers of being out past curfew, knowing what could happen if she was caught, she started finding her way some evenings to a friend's house where she and maybe five or six other friends would gather in the basement and they would dance and they would talk all night, dreaming even if just for a few moments about what life would be like if it just went back to normal. She even started dating someone, a young man named Yehuda. And I'm gonna show you a picture that I found, um, which is, a little bit after the war, but I love this image of Bobby as a young woman, vibrant, beautiful. And I, I imagine her in the ghetto in this scary, horrific time, sneaking out of her house, risking her own life, trying to get away from her parents for a few minutes, trying to go see her friends and just hang out and having a boyfriend. I love that image. But even as Bobby Sarah and Yehuda's young romance blossomed, the reality of life in the ghetto was never far away. Some nights they'd show up to dance and they'd notice that one of their friends wasn't there, that they'd been taken in the previous night's raid. After a year of living like this in the Lublin ghetto, the Nazis moved Bobby and the remaining Jews to the nearby village of Majdanek forcing them to build a concentration camp. Out of that group of friends who had gathered in the evenings to dance, Bobby Sarah and Yehuda were the only two left. In the fall of 1941, construction of the Majdanek concentration camp was nearly complete and Bobby Sarah was 19. Early one morning, the Nazis pulled all of the Jews out of their homes into the village square. Bobby Sarah was there with her parents and her younger brother, who was 17. Her cousins were there. Her boyfriend Yehuda was there, and he was physically carrying his mother in his arms because she had recently broken her leg and couldn't walk, but he knew she needed to go with them. Hundreds of other Jews were there with them. The Nazis marched them all at gunpoint to the outskirts of the village and in through the gate in the concentration camp's barbed wire fence. Bobby Sarah could hear the gate slam shut behind them and the locks click into place. She described feeling numb and cold. And they were all marched into a building, kind of like the one in the middle picture at the top there and crammed into two massive rooms like the one in the top left. And it wasn't until many years later that Bobby Sarah realized that room, those rooms, those were the Majdanek gas chambers 
where tens of thousands of Jews would later be murdered. Around three o'clock that afternoon, her boyfriend Yehuda brought Bobby Sarah a little piece of bread he had found and a little bit of news. He had heard from one of the guards who had said that that night at midnight, the guard would open the gate, pretend to look away, and anyone who wanted to could try to escape. Now, what possessed this guard to risk his own safety to let some Jews escape? I have no idea. I don't know if it was compassion, if it was pity, if it was something sinister, a cruel joke. I have no idea. But after three minutes, he said, the guard would close the, the gate and he would release his seven dogs to go chase down anyone who had tried to run. Now he said that everyone who stayed behind at the camp would most certainly be dead soon. So his advice to Yehuda was Farshvinden, disappear. Bobi Sarah and her family debated whether they should try to run. Her father was adamant. I am not gonna sit here and wait to die. I'd rather die trying. Her mother agreed and her brother couldn't imagine being separated from his parents. So only Bobi Sarah was unsure. She looked to Yehuda. What do you think? Should we go? But Yehuda had already made up his mind. My mother can't run. I can't leave her. She needs me here. But you, you have to try. Imagine having to make a choice like that. What would you do? I know that my booby really loved Yehuda. She told me that in the last few years of her life. But she knew that she needed to be with her family and that this was their best chance of surviving. So it was decided that the four of them would run and they would split up as soon as they made it into the woods. And they knew of a Polish Catholic family who lived in the village nearby who had been helpful before. And they thought, they hoped that maybe the family would help them again. Once they made it there, they could regroup and then figure out what comes next. Now, once their plan was set, Bobby Sarah's aunt approached them holding her five-year-old son on her hip. I can't run, there's no way I'll make it, but you will survive, she said. You have to take my Yosela with you. Bubi and her family again debated what to do. Could they take him with them? Could they keep him quiet all night? Could, they, could he keep up with them as they ran through the woods? They knew that if they left him behind, he would most likely be dead within days. But if they took him with them, they realized it would surely spell capture and death for all of them. Sometimes I wonder what I would have done in that situation. And it's an impossible question. There's no good answer. So they told Aunt Mira that no, they could not take her son. As hard as it was, this was the only way they would have any chance of escape. And many years later, towards the end of Bobby Sarah's life, she would often tell me that she kept seeing young Yosela's face in her dreams. She couldn't shake the feeling of turning her back on him, even though she knew it was the only way they could have made it. So as nighttime fell, the room grew quiet and complete darkness set in. Bubi spent those hours huddled close with Yehuda, hugging, kissing, saying their goodbyes. And at midnight, true to his word, the guard opened the gate. He said, good luck. And then he turned away. The crowd surged towards the gate. Bobi Sarah felt Yehuda physically pushing her out towards the gate, away from him, but out towards a chance at freedom. And in the rush, she was separated from her parents and her brother, and she could hear the dogs barking. And she told me later that she just kept thinking in her head, I'd rather be killed by a bullet than torn apart by a dog's jaws. 
So she put her head down and she ran. She ran out into the woods, into the night. As morning was breaking, Libby Sarah made it to the Catholic family's house. She was relieved to find that her parents and her brother had made it there ahead of her. And the family had welcomed them in, given them a place to stay, a little bit of food, but only for a little while, because they knew it was too dangerous to keep them there longer. I don't know much about this family. I don't know who they were. I don't know why they chose to risk their own lives to help some Jews escape, especially when so many other Polish people did not. But I know in my heart that without them, Bobby Sarah and her family would not have made it out alive. Bobby often talked later in life about how her outlook changed after escaping from Maidanek. So many others would not make it out alive. Not her cousin Yosele, not her boyfriend Yehuda, who had literally pushed her away from him to freedom. She felt that she had been given this extraordinary chance to stay alive, and it filled her with the will to go on, to fight for her life, to make sure, in her words, that her survival was worth it. So they made their way to Warsaw, a three-hour train ride away, and they went to find another non-Jewish family that they had known. And I can only imagine their hearts being in their throats as they knocked on the apartment door of that family. They weren't sure if they, that family would take them in or turn them in. But we learned that the war had been hard on this family too. And yet despite the risks to them and their neighbors, they just, the family decided to help. And for the next three and a half years, Bobby Sarah and her parents survived by hiding from the Nazis in this family's apartment, through that door in the middle, up those stairs to the left, with the help of this woman, Germaine, on the right. Their days took on a monotonous routine. They'd wake early, quickly wash their faces, have the smallest breakfast, just enough to get by before their hosts left for work. And again, I'm gonna let Bobby Sarah explain to you what a day was like in the apartment. We stayed in that a closed, cold room, hot, cold summer winter, and we didn't move. We didn't go to the bathroom, we didn't eat, we didn't drink. When they came in the evening, they would open the closed door let us out and we'd all go to the bathroom once, flush once, and they'll put up a tea kettle for some, and then we did the cooking and the cleaning for them. Then we do the work like, but no more than two people walked at the same time. If they walked, we sat. If they sat, my mother and I walked. If my father had to go somewhere, then one of us sat. This way, there was no suspicion on the lower floor, no sound, no sign. So again, when I share this clip with students, I ask them why they think they were so concerned about making noise. It's another stark reminder that most people in Poland were very willing and ready to turn in Jews. They did not want to be caught hiding or harboring anybody. Now, three and a half years, that's a long time. For context, for, for us, right? Three and a half years, that's like a full year before any of us had ever heard the word COVID. That's a long time ago. And so imagine being stuck in that small apartment for that long. For Bobby Sarah, it was lonely, it was scary. Frankly, it was boring. They were totally cut off from the outside world, except for the little pieces of news that their hosts brought in. Like when they brought word that Bobby Sarah's older brother, who had been in prison for two years, was killed. Bobby Sarah and her family were devastated. Occasionally, though, small moments of hope pushed through. 
In the spring of 1943, their hosts received an extra ration of eggs from the government for the Easter holiday to help celebrate Easter. And I love talking with students in the classroom about the Easter holiday. A lot of people are familiar with it. They color eggs, they know eggs. And I asked them what Jewish holiday happens around the same time. Sometimes people know, sometimes they don't. And so we talk about Passover and how eggs are a very symbolic part of our Passover celebration. They symbolize life. They symbolize continuity. They symbolize spring and rebirth. I don't think their hosts knew all of that, but they knew that eggs were important. And when they came home with that extra ration of eggs for Easter, they brought two of those eggs to Bubi Sarah and her parents. They wanted them to have something special to celebrate their holiday. It wasn't much, but this little act of kindness had a huge impact on Bubi Sarah. She talked about it every year at our Passover Seder. It helped her realize that maybe there would be a world worth living in when this was all done. And eventually, news came that the tide of the war was turning. And in the spring of 1945, the Russian army reached Warsaw and freed it from the grip of the Nazis. The war was ending. For Bobby Sarah and her mother and her father, they weren't quite sure what that would mean. We stayed in that the, a closed, cold room. We stayed. When we sit by ourselves, we'd talk. What if there are no more Jews in this world? If we are the only three who survived, there is nobody else, what are we going to do? I can't imagine that feeling, not knowing if maybe we're the only three Jews left in the world. So when it was safe to do so, and the Nazis were no longer in control of Warsaw and that section of Poland, they left Warsaw and returned to their home city of Lublin. And they checked in each day at the Displaced Persons Committee, looking for family, for friends, for anybody that they knew who had managed to survive. After a few weeks, they reconnected with a young man whom uh, Bobby Sarah knew because her older brother had been good yes. friends with him. This is him. His name was Sasha. He had just returned to Lublin from Russia, where he had fled at the beginning of the war. He was the only member of his family to survive. Bobby Sarah and Sasha started spending time together, soon spending every day together, and soon in a matter of weeks, they decided to get married. And then along with Bubi Sarah's parents, they moved to New York City with the help of the parents and grandparents of some of the people who I know are watching tonight and are with us on this program, distant cousins that we knew in New York City. And they began, they, they did their best to create a new life as immigrants in a new country, a new place, Bubi Sarah and Sasha, my grandfather, my Zadie, had three kids. Uh, this is my mom on the, the bottom right of this middle picture. They created a successful fabric business and they danced through many years of happiness and warmth together. Now it took Bubi Sarah, like many survivors, it took her a long time to be able to talk about what happened to talk about how she survived the Holocaust and about all the others who didn't. When her husband and her parents passed away when I was a young kid, she realized that she was the last of the survivors in her family. And that if she didn't start sharing her story, that nobody would know. She met a wonderful man named Morris. That's him in the bottom left who became her second husband and my grandpa Morris, who helped her start talking. She soon agreed to sit for, uh, with the Shoah Foundation to record her testimony. And grandpa Morris would sit at his typewriter and type her stories and put it together into this manuscript. Um, it's on the top left. I have a copy here with me all the time that has really become our family treasure. It's our, our collection of Bobby Sarah's stories. 
And this gave Booby the courage to start talking. And those of you who know her know that once she started talking, you couldn't get her to stop. So she started telling her story to anyone who would listen. And that included going into classrooms, going into schools, talking with students, talking with people over card games, talking with people over dinner, talking with my friends when they would come over after high school looking for cookies, and she would sit and talk. She wanted to make sure that nobody would forget, or even worse, deny the horrors that she had witnessed. She wanted people to know that humankind is capable of such cruelty and humanity, inhumanity, and that so many people saw what was happening and chose to go along with it. But she also loved talking about all the people whose choices along the way made it possible for her to survive. Of the guard who decided to let the gate open and let some Jews run. Of the families who risked their lives to take in some refugee Jews. Of the incredible hope that could be given by the simple gift of an egg for Passover. Bubi Sarah knew that the choices we make, even the smallest ones, matter. That yes, we have the capacity to be for committing or allowing horrendous acts, but we also have the capacity to be kind, to be human, to save each other every single day in the small acts of compassion that we have the choice to live and to help each other go on living. Thank you for letting me share her story with you. Dave, thank you so much. What a um, incredibly moving account of your Bobby Sarah's amazing story. We're really so grateful to you. It was just um, beautifully delivered and just lovely. We really appreciate it. Um, there's a lot of comments coming in to us uh, that we will share with you, of course, about everyone else on the call, also equally moved um, and very happy to be here. So we have um, some great questions already coming in. Please feel free to, um, to keep them coming. Don't be shy. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, and you could email us if we don't quite get to your question, but we'll try and, and get to as many as we can. I'm not even sure how, how long we have, but we'll do what we, what we can. The first, um, the first question that I'll ask you is, there's a couple of people that are questioning what happened to Bobby Sarah's younger brother. Mm. Yeah, um, it's a question I get often from students and uh, like a little uh, sneak peek, it's a little bit intentional that I mention him and I, I've, I've decided not to include his story in the main telling because it's so powerful on its own and um, sometimes it it uh, it throws me off track, like it's doing right now. So um, when they were in hiding in Warsaw, there were several close calls where the family was almost discovered, and the host family who was was hiding them was getting more and more nervous. And after one particularly close call, where they almost all got uh, discovered, which would have meant not only death for Bobby Sarah and her family, but also for the host family and probably for many of their neighbors as well. And so the host family said, you know what, we need to find a different, a, a different solution. You need to find a different place to live. And so it was decided that Bobby's younger brother, who by that point was probably around 18 or 19, um, would go out into the ghetto in Warsaw to find a few connections, to talk to a few people that they thought might be able to help and to find a new place to live. And he left the apartment and somewhere along the street, he was arrested by an officer and was brought to the police station who knew that he was Jewish and knew that he was outside the ghetto wall and therefore he was hiding somewhere. And the word got back to Bubi and her parents that the police were interrogating her brother and torturing him. Sorry. And doing things that were, that what got back to Libby Sarah was enough to make just unspeakable things. And for four days, he endured this and refused to give up any information. And by the, by the fourth day, 
when the police finally shot him, Bobby and her parents thought that that was a blessing at that point. That's a, a very, very, very full, powerful answer, Dave. Um, uh, changing, changing gears a little bit. Um, and this is a question I get uh, a lot uh, from uh, students uh, in, in many different schools. Um, in, in your in her later years, did your grandmother's view of Germans change significantly? Did she develop a more accepting attitude towards the post-war generation of Germans, or did she retain a bitter and vindictive outlook towards all Germans? Yeah, uh, that, that's a great question. Um, I never talked directly with her about it, although I do remember many times growing up hearing comments about, you know, like, not being able to buy a Volkswagen or not visiting Germany, not having any association with anything German. Um, I then, as a young adult, brought home the beautiful woman who's now my wife, who has German ancestry and whose stepfather has spent time living in Germany, studying German, and I was nervous. I didn't know how Bobby Sarah was going to respond to me bringing someone into our house and our family who had such connections to Germany. Um, and Bobby Sarah always surprised me. And she seemed to be able to kind of compartmentalize a little bit her feelings about what she experienced at the hands of the Germans versus the capacity for other people to choose different path, choose different course. And she got to know Sarah very quickly and welcomed her openly into our family. Um, and uh, in Bobby Sarah's typical way, those of you who know her will know this, this kind of story. Um, before we got married, she, as a way of showing how much she loved Sarah and loved the fact that we were together and we're getting ready to start our family, she wanted to make it clear to us that she was okay if we, if Sarah had a, a baby bump as she was walking down the aisle. And Bobby Sarah's phrase, she said, I may be old, but I'm not old fashioned. Um, and I love that. It's a, a bit of a detour, Aaron, from the question, but it, it's really indicative for me of how her views and her personal feelings about what she went through and what she experienced. Um, I think she tried not to make that color my views and my experience of other people. That's amazing, Dave. And probably um, I, would, I would think a, a, a rare response um so yeah. it's, it's it says a lot about about your booby um question about the speaking of rare about how it, it was rare for a survivor to survive with their parents um and the question is do, are you aware of of you know did they talk about their the holocaust together was there any kind of communication between them or was it sort of a shared secret that's a really good question um i actually don't know the answer to that my um, my, so Booby's father passed away just before I was born and, um, I have his name as my middle name and her mother passed away, uh, when I was five or six, right after my Zadie passed away. Um, my understanding is that they didn't talk very much about what had happened. Um, that it was, it was not something that was openly discussed in the house. Um, it was not openly discussed with my mom and her siblings, um, but kind of the, the series of events of my Zadie passing away, my Bobby Esther passing away, Zadie Simcha had been uh, gone for a few years, was kind of what helped Bobby realize that she needed to start talking and she needed to figure out a way to, to process it. Thanks, Dave. Um, actually, just picking, piggybacking off of that, um, you know, you, you began uh, your uh, presentation with a, a really beautiful photo of uh, your son and, and Bubby. Um, how's your experience uh, as a proud 3G affected or influenced uh, your, your 4G children? Well, that's, uh, that's a good question. Fortunately, they are both at summer camp this week, so they can't be here to answer it for themselves. Um, but they, um, uh, you know, I, I like many 3Gs, I imagine, and, and 2Gs as well, um, I wondered when I should start sharing this story with them um, when they were little. And I, I didn't want to burden them or scare them or anything like that. And um, with the, the loving help and prodding of a very close friend, um, 
who convinced me that they needed to know from a very early age. And so I and we have talked with them from very early on about, about what Bobby Sarah went through, uh, not all the details necessarily. But now that they're old enough to understand and to process and to watch me go through this process of learning how to tell her story and taking on the responsibility of sharing it with others and learning with so many other three Gs and helping them kind of take ownership of their story and find a way to pass that on to future generations. I think that Owen and Anya are in their quiet ways, really soaking it in and taking on this as part of their identity, their Jewishness, their connection to this family. And I've seen it come out in ways that as they talk with their friends, um, I've now presented in Owen's class and this year we'll present in Anya's class um, and watching them embrace not only their Jewishness, their Jewishness certainly, but their Jewishness and their connection to the Holocaust is really, really powerful and, and meaningful for me. Um, and I think being in community and in conversation with all of you, with 3GNY and with the, the people that we work with on a regular basis has helped me have those conversations with them. And it's, it's really incredible. Um, and I'm, I'm so grateful for that opportunity. Thanks, Dave. I have to pick up on a comment, which I'm glad I, I was sort of reading the chat because we have a comment from your mom. Hi, Dave's <laughs> mom. Um, and she says that her mother definitely did change. This is in relation to the to the question about feelings about um, about Germans. But she says my mother definitely did change her attitude over the years, but it took a really long time. She had more trouble changing her attitude towards Poles, other than the few who helped her and others. So I just wanted to share that. Um, there's a question in the chat as well about uh, what what happened to the host family and was Bobby Sarah's family in touch with them after after the war and and I guess following up on that were they ever um, recognised as righteous among the nations and can you speak a little bit about what you might know about what happened to to the host family? Sure, um, thanks, Mom, for clarifying. Um, feel free to continue to do so as I answer some of these questions. Uh, so my understanding of what happened with the host family is that I, I believe they lost touch for a while. And then at some point in the 1980s or 90s, maybe after the, the communist, the, the, the wall fell and the, the communist bloc kind of opened up, um, that Bobby got back in touch with the family. And Jermaine, the woman whose picture I showed, she had passed away a while ago, she was a bit older. Um, but in that host family, it was Jermaine, and her daughter, her stepdaughter, who was the same age as Bobby. Her name was Julia, or Julia. And at some point in the, I believe the 1990s, Bobby and Julia reconnected and started a, like a pen pal relationship. And through Julia's kids, Bobby learned that, you know, in, in communist Poland, elder care was not really a thing. There wasn't much support systems in place and that Julia was struggling. And Bobby, from that point on, started sending money back to the family to help provide care for Yulia um, until the day she died. That's, uh, that's really incredible, Dave. Um, uh, just one more question here. Uh, since, uh, and this goes to uh, how we were talking about how you uh, structured your story, um, since you mentioned you're the grandson of, of four survivors, what do you, uh, why did you choose to tell the story of your Bubby Sarah? Um, so Bubby Sarah is the one of my four grandparents who I got to know the best, um, who I had the biggest, per the, the most personal relationship with. Um, she, like, like I said, she was alive until two years ago. And so I, I got to know her as a kid, as an adolescent, um, and as an adult and a parent, which I'm so incredibly grateful that I, I was able to do that and that she was able to, to meet and really know her great-grandchildren. Um, so I, I know her better, but I also know her story better. As I've said a few times, my, my grandfather didn't really talk. Um, we still know very few details about how he survived. We know he fled to Russia and was in the Russian army for a few years. I don't know what he was doing or where he was. And that at some point he fled when, when the war was ending, he realized that he needed to get out of Russia quick. And so he deserted the Russian army and made his way back to Lublin. Um, 
my father's parents were in Poland and Russia and were, were sent, they ended up in Uzbekistan for a while. Um, I also don't have a lot of information about them. I would like to learn more. And so the, the quick answer, Aaron, is that my, my booby Sarah's story is the one who's I know best. Uh, the longer answer is that my hope is that over time and have, being able to do a little bit more research and talking to family members and, and really trying to unearth whatever we can, that I can learn and possibly even be able to tell some of the other stories as well. Thanks, Dave. Um, there's a question here about, uh, the question is, how do you feel you can share the lessons of the Holocaust in a way that will reach young people in the most impactful way? And I'd like to just kind of um, piggyback on that question by just, um, you know, asking about your experience currently as, as you know, our first executive director and sort of, you know, how, how you know, whether you can tell us a little bit about sort of, you know, how your history is impacting your job or vice versa. Um, sure, in, in two minutes or less, yeah. <laughs> uh, so the, I guess the, the quick answer, and it, it, it is the reason that I am so grateful for this, this organization, this program, and for being in this role is that um, there's so much that we can learn and know and teach about the Holocaust and that we need to, and that's really important to. Um, I'm not a historian. But I do know my family and I know the impact that, that their experiences have had on, on my grandparents, on my parents and on me and now on my kids. And I know that when um, I'm, I'm trained as an educator and with a real focus on building empathy. And I know that when we can build an empathetic connection with kids, it gives them a reason to care, someone to care about, something to care about. And that might be enough of a spark to help them want to learn more, whether it's about the Holocaust and World War II and history and politics, or if it's just about the way that we each interact with each other, the way that we offer compassion and kindness and care, the way that we choose to stand up when we see something wrong happening. And so one of the things that I love about this role and this organization is the way that we get to work together as 3Gs to own our family stories, to really be the stewards of our family testimony and help make that something that builds that personal bridge for others so that everyone has an opportunity to, to really get to know not the enormity of the Holocaust, hopefully they will explore that on their own, but we have a unique opportunity to help them really get to know one person and one person through us that will help give them a reason to care about the story. Dave, thank you. I think that is a poignant, beautiful, perfect place to end the presentation. So thank you to everybody who, um, who uh, asked the questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. Um, Dave, thank you so much for speaking tonight and for sharing your Booby story. We are so grateful. And that's an understatement to have you at the helm of our organization. Um, and thank you to Aaron so much as well for being part of our program. And we're really glad that you've uh, joined the 3GNY family too. Uh, thank you to everybody that joined us tonight. We're really glad that you took the time to hear Dave speak words about his booby that must never be forgotten. If you haven't yet made a gift to support our educational programs, we hope that you'll consider making one now. Please refer to the chat for the ways that you can donate and we thank you so much in advance. Also, if you have connections with educators who may want our speakers to present in their classrooms, please let us know. We have a large speaker bureau of hundreds of grandchildren ready to prepare, uh, ready, ready and prepared to present, um, just like you saw Dave do tonight. So we would love any, um, any leads on that front. We will send out an email tomorrow with information on upcoming events, um, but I just wanna highlight a few. Um, tomorrow evening, 3GNJ, that's 3G in New Jersey, is hosting an in-person happy hour in Bridgewater. Um, you can visit them on Facebook for more details. On August 10th, we're hosting a Survivor Salon, an intimate discussion with Survivor Ralph Raybrock on Zoom. And in early September, join us for Bagels and Babies, a meetup for 3Gs and their young 4G children. So keep an eye out for the emails and social media posts with details of all of that that is um, coming up. So the email's coming out tomorrow, which again, we'll share those events, but also a recording of tonight's program. Um, and you can also check out our past We Do Wednesday speakers and other events on 3GNY's YouTube channel. 
Um, so that is it from us. We will be sure to share all of the amazing comments that you've left. Um, and if there's any questions in there, we'll try and, and answer them in, in emails. Um, we really appreciate everybody being here. Thank you so much for taking the time this evening. We're grateful as always for your presence and support. Good night. <laughs>